Welcome to chapter 20 of Anatomy and Physiology, where, like usual, we're just hopping from organ system to organ system. And in chapter 20, we're now hopping on to the lymphatic system, sometimes called the immune system. And like always, before we even get started, you know some things about this chapter already. You know some things about this organ system already from AMP1. Remember, you might remember at least one organ in this system. It's things like the spleen or your lymph nodes or your lymphatic vessels. These are organs in the lymphatic system. And you might recall from AMP1, one major function, one basic function of the lymphatic system is to provide immune protection meaning to fight infections and prevent diseases. So it's called the lymphatic system, but sometimes referred to as the immune system. So when you call it the immune system, you're really saying one of the functions of this system, which is to provide immunity, which means to protect the body from any diseases um, or disorders that might be coming on. So as we go through this chapter, we're really going to do the usual. We're going to break down the anatomy. We're going to talk about the organs. And again, I recall some of the organs in this system are things like the spleen, things like your lymph nodes, your tonsils. Think about anything that might fight infections, your tonsils, uh, your thymus. These are all lymphatic system organs. And so we'll break down some of their anatomies, look at them, and talk about how they're helping you to fight infections. And then we'll break it down microscopically as well. And you know some of this from our previous chapter on blood. Remember, there are some cells in your blood that fight infections. Remember, they're your leukocytes. They're your white blood cells. So yeah, we're going to have to talk about some of the white blood cells. Let me give you a hint. It's called lymphatic system. So some of the white blood cells we're going to have to talk about are lymph nodes. They are all kind of having this similar part to the name, lymph, because they're all part of the lymphatic system. So that's all we're going to be doing. And I mentioned the large function of your lymphatic system is to provide immune protection, meaning it's going to provide an immune response, meaning things like your white blood cells are going to help you to fight infections. But... This system does other things. Turns out this system can help to absorb and transport fats and things dissolved in fats. Things that can dissolve in fats are what we call lipid soluble. And some of these things that are lipid soluble are actually vitamins. Turns out vitamins A, D, E, and K are all lipid soluble vitamins. Meaning when you eat them, they're going to mix with fat in your body and that's how you're going to absorb them. And so you're going to need your lymphatic system to help you to absorb these lipid soluble vitamins. So it can absorb things and help you to uh, transport things around the body. And we'll see that in the form of these lymphatic vessels. They're kind of similar to blood vessels, but instead of carrying blood, they carry lymph. Why? Because one function of lymphatic system is to carry things, to transport things, mainly fats. And then because it's transporting some of these fats, as well as a a little bit of liquid, it's actually going to have a say on your fluid volume because there are some fluids inside your lymphatic vessels. We'll see it later. Don't worry. So because there are lymphatic vessels carrying these fluids, they could help to regulate your body's fluid volume. And so, yes, the major function of your lymphatic system is to fight infection, but it could also absorb and transport transport fats and it could regulate your body's fluid volume. When we talk about the fluid that your lymphatic system can sometimes carry, we're really talking about the fluid outside of your cells. Remember, that's extracellular fluid, also called interstitial fluid. And your lymphatic system can transport some of this interstitial fluid around your body. Remember, this is just the fluid around your cells. It's very similar to plasma. Only difference between interstitial fluid and plasma, largely, is that interstitial fluid has less proteins. Remember, we've already talked about plasma now, so you know all the different types of proteins in your plasma. Interstitial fluid will just have less of those proteins in it. 
And it's just that liquid environment around the cells. Remember, we know from A and P1, there's liquid inside the cell, but there's also liquids outside the cell. It's called interstitial fluid, and your lymphatic system will help to transport that fluid around the body and exchange it in and out with the cardiovascular system. But again, we're going to focus on the organs in this system first. We're going to look at this system macroscopically, breaking down the anatomy of the major organs, and then we'll break it down microscopically, revisiting our cells and talking about what everything does. And you remember, a lot of the organs in this system will have lymph in the name because they're part of the lymphatic system. First, there's something called lymph. Lymph is that interstitial fluid I've mentioned before plus fat. So when we look at the lymphatic vessels, which I mentioned earlier, are very similar to blood vessels. They're not carrying blood. They're carrying this fluid we call lymph. And lymph, again, is just that interstitial fluid plus the fat that's mixed with it. So if you were to look at lymph, it would look kind of milky because you would see all the fat in that liquid. So lymph is getting carried by lymphatic vessels. And then there are other lymphatic tissue structures. There are other structures that will have lymphatic tissue, meaning white blood cells helping to fight infections. And you remember, some of these white blood cells are really all your white blood cells, like all the other cells in your body, need to be made. And you remember, we make them in an, in an organ. We make it in our bone, specifically in our bone marrow, really specifically in our red bone marrow. So because that's where we make some of our lymphatic system cells, a.k.a. our lymph nodes, or sorry, our, our lymphocytes, well, the red bone marrow is also an organ in the lymphatic system. <clears throat> and on this image here, you're just seeing all the different organs in the lymphatic system highlighted. For example, when you look at this image, this cartoon depiction of this woman, you're seeing all these creepy green lines all over the place. Those creepy green lines are the lymphatic vessels. The only thing is they're carrying lymph. They're just carrying this interstitial fluid plus fat. What else? You see they've highlighted some of the red bone marrow. Why? Because that's where you're making, at least in initially, your lymphocytes. So it's also technically a part of this system. If you look closely, you'll see little green dots speckled around kind of usually around these lymphatic vessels. You'll see these little green dots scattered around this woman. You're looking at lymph nodes. That's why you might notice whenever you get sick or you get uh, a head cold even, and you go to the doctor, they might seem like they're rubbing your neck. Why? Turns out you have lots of little lymph nodes in your neck. So if they swell, that's usually a sign that your body's fighting some type of pathogen. Keep going, lots of organs. There's also things like the spleen. Remember, the spleen is in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. So you see it on this woman here. It will also play a role in your lymphatic system. So there's lots and lots of, of organs in this system. We'll go through a couple and talk about what they do in, in association with the lymphatic system. Starting off with those lymphatic vessels. Again, I told you they're very similar to blood vessels. They're really similar to capillaries. They're they're very small blood vessels. And what are they? And when you look at them, they'll have a similar anatomy. It is a vessel, very similar to a blood vessel. So it will also have endothelial cells. It will have that simple squamous epithelium, a.k.a. that endothelium lining the inside of it. And it's just slightly larger than a capillary. So it'll have a little bit more uh, connective tissue helping to hold it together, but not that much. <clears throat> so when you think a lymphatic vessel, think a slightly larger capillary. And so what's, what's going on here? Turns out these tiny capillaries are helping to, ex these lymphatic capillaries are helping to exchange these liquids I mentioned, this lymph, this interstitial fluid and fat between the cells. That's all it's doing. It's just transporting this liquid around from cell to cell, tissue to tissue, organ to organ. 
And then once it needs to return that lymph, that liquid back to the blood, it's going to begin to merge together. It's almost like veins. When they have to bring the liquid back to the bloodstream, these tiny lymphatic capillaries are going to begin to merge together to form larger lymphatic vessels that will look more like veins now meaning they're going to have valves because you remember like veins, they're kind of thin walled and they're not going to be able to overcome pressure. So they're going to need valves to help prevent backflow of liquid. But other than that, again, it's not that much to a lymphatic vessel. And these lymphatic vessels are going to exchange liquid again with the cells using lymphatic capillaries. Then they'll merge together to form lymphatic vessels, which will gen then return that liquid to the bloodstream so you could recycle it and, and do it again. Turns out to dump this liquid back into the bloodstream, back into a blood vessel, you're going to need to use a duct. I remember ducts are just tiny tubes funnel, funneling liquids from place to place. Turns out your lymphatic vessels, these larger lymphatic vessels, have tiny ducts to help them to return the liquid to the bloodstream. So to help kind of wrap your mind around it, here's this figure here out of figure 20.3. You're just really recycling liquid. We saw in the cardiovascular system, your blood is just on one continuous loop around the body. This lymphatic fluid is pretty much doing the same thing. You'll remove some of that fluid, basically plasma minus all of that protein. Then you'll mix it with some fat and transport it around your cells. And then you're going to have to drain it to put it back into the bloodstream so you can recycle it again. That's all you're seeing in this picture here. You're seeing the liquid leave the red arteriole, enter the, in, the lymphatic capillaries, and then you got to return it to a venule. You're just recycling this fluid. Remember, you're one closed circuit. So any fluid just has to get recycled over and over again, minus any waste. But what do I want you to focus on? I want you to know the two ducts, the two major ducts of the lymphatic system, and where are they draining lymph from? That's it. Know the two major ducts in the lymphatic system, and where are they draining the lymph from, the liquid from? There's the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct. So where are they draining lymph from? First is the thoracic duct. It's draining lymph from the left upper body, and the entire lower body. Oh, what is that? It's draining lymph from the left side of the head, the left side of the neck, the left chest, and the left upper limb, as well as the rest of the torso and your lower limbs. All of those areas are getting drained into the thoracic duct. While the right lymphatic duct is draining the rest, what's left over? It's just the right upper part of the body. Your right thoracic duct doesn't drain that much. It only drains the right side of the head, the right side of the neck, the right side of the chest, and the right upper limb. That's it. That's right lymphatic duct. Everything else is drained by the thoracic duct. And that's what you're seeing on this image here. In this, in this smaller image off to the right in the female, you're seeing everything in blue is getting drained by the thoracic duct. By the flesh-colored areas, her right upper head, right side of the neck, right chest, and right upper limb are drained by the right, th uh, right lymphatic duct. And again, you can see where these ducts will drain into the blood vessels. That's all they're doing. They're draining all this lymph, all this interstitial fluid plus fat, and they're moving it around the body until it gets drained into the blood vessels. And you'll recycle that liquid. And so that's what your lymphatic vessels are doing. They're just like a blood vessel. They're just transporting a liquid. In this case, we call the lymph liquid lymph. That's it. And so now that you know what's going on with your lymphatic vessels, we can now talk about when things go wrong. Turns out things could go wrong with your lymphatic vessels. And one of them is called lymphedema. Lymphedema. Lymphedema is basically when you have a problem with your interstitial fluid and your lymphatic vessels. And it kind of gives you a hint of the name. It's called lymph because you're dealing with that fluid, that interstitial fluid plus fat. And edema. Oh, what's edema? Edema in anatomy is just swelling. And you're swelling because you're having an excess of interstitial fluid. It's not getting drained properly back into the blood vessels. 
And if it's not getting drained back into the blood vessels, well, guess where it's going to stay? Remember, it was originally interstitial fluid, which is around the cells. That's where it's going to stay, and you're going to see that as swelling. And that's what you see on this image of this person here on this slide. On their right side of their body, you can see it's a lot more swollen than the left side. And it's only swollen because they're having a lot of this lymphatic fluid. That's all back up in, into the, the areas, the, into the external environment of the cells, extracellular environment of the cells. And so to correct this, well, or usually what usually causes this is, again, a, a problem with these lymphatic vessels. And it actually could be a problem due to surgery. Sometimes during surgery, you might have blockage of these vessels or they might remove the vessels during the surgery because they're not carrying blood. They're rather small. They might actually accidentally get moved. And if that occurs, well, you're not going to be able to drain the liquid. And so you'll have swelling around the body. Or it could just simply be a blockage in the vessel. Again, no matter what, you're not being able to return the liquid to the cardiovascular system, back to the blood. And then so it will back up around the cells and you'll see that as swelling. That's lymphedema. And that's a little bit on your lymphatic vessels. But again, there's more. We got to talk about other organs. Remember, there are lots of organs in this system. There are so many organs, we actually break them up. Like usual, we love to categorize things in anatomy. And we do that with the organs in the lymphatic system. When you look at all the organs in the lymphatic system, they fall into one or two groups. There are primary lymphatic organs, and there are secondary. I want you to know which organs are primary lymphatic organs and which organs are secondary. And it's super simple. It has to deal with the cells, although I'm talking about lymphocytes. If you are a place where we make or, and or mature lymphocytes, you are a primary lymphatic organ. If you're not, well, then you're a secondary. So you actually know the answer from our previous chapter. Remember, where do you make initially all the cells of your blood? Red bone marrow. So red bone marrow is a primary lymphatic organ. And then you remember specifically for T and B lymphocytes, remember where do you mature them? Remember they give you a hint in the name. Remember B cells mature still in the bone marrow, red bone marrow. While your T cells begin with a T because they mature in the thymus. So your thymus is also a primary lymphatic organ. Just think, where do you make and or mature your lymphocytes? It's going to be red bone marrow and thymus. So those are the two primary lymphatic organs of the lymphatic system. And then all the other organs then will be secondary. Just name any other organ in the lymphatic system. Odds are it's going to be a secondary, like your lymphatic vessels, like your spleen, your lymph nodes. There's things called lymphatic nodules. We'll see them later. There are things like your tonsils are considered lymphatic nodules. Name any other organ here. It's a secondary lymphatic system organ. And so that's all you're seeing in these pictures here. This first image is showing you your first... Uh, your primary lymphatic organs. Again, it's just your red bone marrow. Remember, we see that on the inner portions of our long bone, trapped in that spongy bone. That's all you're seeing here. And off to the right, you're seeing the thymus, which is located anterior to the heart in your chest. It kind of sits anterior to the heart. And when you're when you're young, when you're a little baby, it's really big, huge, almost taking up the entire chest anteriorly. But as you get older, it shrinks and shrinks because as you get older, you've already done the work of maturing your T cells. So you don't need as big a thymus. So as you get older, it actually atrophies. It actually gets smaller. But again, just simply know red bone marrow and thymus are your primary lymphatic system organs because red bone marrow is where you're going to initially make your B and T cells and it's where you're going to mature your B cells while the thymus is where you're going to mature your T-cells. And then again, you remember all the other organs in, in your lymphatic system then will be classified as secondary lymphatic organs. Remember, just name any. That's all you're seeing on this picture here. Lymphatic vessels, the tonsils behind your tongue, 
the your spleen, your lymph nodes, uh, even those tiny ducts we mentioned that return the lymph to the bloodstream. These are all considered secondary lymphatic system organs. And again, besides fighting infections, another thing your lymphatic system does is transport this lymph. And this image is showing you, it's just a closed circuit. You're removing lymph from the bloodstream, circulating it around the body, and then you got to bring it back. It's just a closed loop. But again, let's continue our journey through the rest of these orga uh, lymphatic system organs and tissues. I mentioned some of your organs, lymphatic system organs, will have what's considered lymphatic tissue. And I kind of briefly mentioned earlier, lymphatic tissue is basically where you have your white blood cells, mainly your lymphocytes. That's all the primary lymphatic tissue is. Think, where are my T and B cells? <clears throat> and it turns out T and B cells aren't the only cells in this system. So we got to look at the three major cells in the lymphatic system, and I want you to know what they do. You know two of them already from our last chapter. You already know B cells make antibodies against antigens that don't belong to you. We call those foreign antigens. And T cells kill other cells. Remember, for good reason. Remember, they'll either kill a viral, virus-infected cell, they'll kill an abnormal cell, or a cancerous cell. And there's one more cell in the lymphatic system. It's your phagocytes. Think macrophages, think your monocytes. Remember, phagocytes are cells that eat things. And you remember your macrophages, aka your specific type of monocytes, they phagocytize things that don't belong. Remember, that could be another cell, a dead or dying cell, or maybe just garbage, cellular debris. Okay, so these cells, because they eat things that don't belong, well, they're going to be part of your lymphatic system because that's kind of like protecting you from pathogens. So those are your three major cells. B cells make antibodies. T cells kill infected cells, abnormal cells, or cancerous cells. And phagocytes eat and destroy anything that doesn't belong, which can be other cells. And then so we look at some organs that have this lymphatic tissue. One group are your lymph nodes. Remember, we saw those as the tiny little green dots sprinkled around that female's body on the picture earlier. Your lymph nodes have this lymphatic tissue. It has these white blood cells in it. So it's going to help to remove any pathogens that don't belong. So you kind of think of your lymph node literally as a filter. As, as blood or lymph passes through, because it's associated with your lymphatic vessels, so as lymph passes through, it will remove any foreign antigens and any foreign pathogens in the body. So it will kind of trap it like a net and hold on to it until one of these white blood cells could come and take it away and destroy it. So really, your lymph nodes are providing immune protection because they're where you have clusters of these white blood cells to remove pathogens. And that's all you're seeing on this picture here. What you're seeing on this image is just a blown up lymph node. And when you look inside, you see some dark purplish bluish clusters. Ah, oh, let me give you a hint. We stained this slide, you could imagine, with the methylene blue slide. You're just uh, staying. You're just seeing where you, this lymph node has pockets of these white blood cells. That's all those little purplish circles are in this lymph node. You're just seeing where there are pockets of, of lymphocytes and other white blood cells. And then you'll see these two little straw-like structures. They're just where the lymph will come in via one lymphatic vessel and come out via another. And so you can see, you'll just send all this lymph through this sort of filter-like structure. If any white blood cells notice any antigens that don't belong to you, they will attack and try to remove it. And then you'll send the rest of that cleaned out lymph out of the efferent version of the lymphatic vessels. So think it's just a filter. As things come in, it removes what doesn't belong and sends the rest out. And so that's how your lymph nodes are helping you to fight infection. And another organ is your spleen. When you think of a spleen, literally, think of it as a large lymph node. 
It also has lymphatic tissue. It also has white blood cells inside waiting to remove what doesn't belong. And when we look at the spleen, it's an organ. And you remember to be an organ means you're made up of at least two tissues. So when we look at the spleen, we break it up into two types of tissues, so to speak. They're not true tissues, but think of them as areas of the spleen. There's something called white pulp and something called red pulp. Now, what is that? White pulp kind of gives you a hint in the name. It's called white, so think white blood cells. This is more of your lymphatic tissue. This is where you're going to find all those pockets of lymphocytes and macrophages. And then there's going to be something called red pulp. Red pulp gives you also a hint of the name. It's called red pulp because it's where you have red blood vessels. Remember, this is kind of like the lymph node. The only major difference here is you're sending blood through the spleen, not lymph. And but it'll do the same thing. As the blood enters the white pulp, all those lymphocytes will look for any foreign antigens, remove them and any pathogens, and destroy them and kick out the rest of the clean blood. It's kind of like a big lymph node, except for your blood. But it could do more things. It's an organ, so it could do a lot of other things besides just removing foreign pathogens. And you know some from our pre previous chapter. You know that when a red blood cell gets old, it's going to die, and we're going to have to remove it from the blood. Remember, one way you remove it from the blood was with the spleen. Turns out that's what's happening in the red pulp. That's why you're sending blood there. So you can remove old, dead, or dying red blood cells, as well as platelets. But again, this is an organ. It could do other things. Turns out your spleen could just store platelets. Turns out your spleen could store up, up, up to a third of your body's platelet supply in cases of emergencies. All right. And as a fetus, before you were born, your spleen was actually one of the places where you made blood cells. Turns out before you were born, remember, you're not doing ossification that much yet. Before or you're, con you're not done with ossification before you're born. So you don't really have all your long bones completely made, but yet you still need blood. So it turns out before you were born, aka when you were a fetus, your spleen was actually a place where you made blood cells. So spleen does a lot. Just like the lymph node, it has white pulp, it has lymphocytes to remove and destroy any foreign antigens and, and pathogens. And because of the red pulp, it can remove any old, dead, or defective cells, aka red blood cells, and platelets. It could just store platelets. And before you were born, it was where you were actually making your blood cells. So your spleen does a lot. And so we're looking at a picture of the spleen in this picture here in figure 20.8. You're seeing the spleen. Remember, that's in your left upper quadrant of your abdomen. <clears throat> or your left hypochondriac region to be a little bit more specific. And if we were to cut it open and look inside, off to the right, you're seeing a microscopic image. You're seeing those little dark purplish blue pockets, because again, assume this slide was stained with a methylene blue slide or methylene blue dye. So those little oval pockets, kind of dark purplish blue, you're just seeing where there are clusters of lymphocytes, AKA you're just seeing where there's lots of lymphatic tissue. And so there'll be fighting infections there. And everything else looks a little kind of lighter pinkish, almost reddish. You might even see some blood vessels there. You're looking at the red pulp. So when you look at spleen, you're seeing lots of red pulp and these pockets of white pulp very similar to what you saw in a lymph node. So that's your spleen. Again, lots of organs here. Keep going. Another types of organs, another group of organs are what we call your lymphatic nodules. They are just like the spleen and lymph node. They are just where you have large pockets of lymphatic tissue, where you have large pockets of lympho lymphocytes and macrophages. The only difference is they're not encapsulated like the spleen. The spleen is encapsulated, meaning it has a layer of protection. These don't really have a layer of protection per se. So we call them lymphatic nodules. And there are some examples listed here. There's the tonsils in the back of your, of your mouth. And when people talk about tonsils, 
they don't usually realize you have three pairs of tonsils. You have what we call your pharyngeal tonsils and the nasal pharynx higher up. Remember your nasal pharynx thing posterior to the nasal cavity, so higher up. And you also have palatine tonsils behind the oral cavity. Behind the tongue, you will also see the lingual tonsils, or more posterior and inferior to the tongue will be the lingual tonsils. So when you're having this pain in your neck and throat when you're sick, especially with a head cold, you're just feeling your tonsils stretch because they're filling up with what's making you sick. Now you know why your throat hurts, why your tonsils hurt when you're sick. They're just doing their job. Their lymphocytes and macrophages are trapping any antigens or pathogens that don't belong and destroying them. And that takes time, so your tonsils are going to fill with them. They're going to stretch, and you'll feel that as pain. Remember, if we know anatomy, we'll, we can help to explain what happens in life. There are other lymphatic nodules also in the body. Another one is what you might have seen in AMP1 when you did digestive system. Remember, you probably had to tell the difference between the ileum and the rest of the small intestine, the du duodenum and jejunum. And you remember one way it was under the microscope. Remember, when you looked at the ileum, you saw something called a Peyer's patch. Think back to AMP1. Remember, a Peyer's patch was where you had a cluster of lymphocytes, a cluster of these little purplish blue cells. Now you know you were just looking at a lymphatic nodule. You were just looking at where you had a cluster of these cells. You were just looking at lymphatic tissue. And so even in your intestines, you're fighting infections. And then there's even your appendix. Your appendix is also a lymphatic nodule. It's where you have lots of lymphocytes and macrophages helping to fight infections. That's what your appendix, at least one major function of, of your appendix is. So all these things are part of your lymphatic system because they're all helping to fight infections. And yes, remember, you'll have lymphatic tissues in other places. We saw it's in the lymph nodes and the spleen. All right. And so they're all basically providing this immune reaction. They're all reacting to whenever there's a foreign pathogen or foreign antigen in the body. That's all. And so that's the basic anatomy of your lymphatic system. So the rest of this chapter switches gears. And like usual, we're going to talk about the physiology. We know how they all basically work, which is to fight the infections. But now we got to look at it. How does your body recognize the infection and what's the order of events that's going to occur? Turns out when we look at your lymphatic system working to fight infections, aka your immune system, it will fight the infection or the foreign pathogen using what we call three lines of defense. Kind of thing, when you're fighting an infection, it's kind of like a war. You're going to send waves of soldiers to fight. We call these waves of soldiers to fight your lines of defense. And your lymphatic system, aka your immune system, has three lines of defense. The first line of defense is going to provide a basic barrier for protection. All right. So when you hear first line defenses, think barriers. Uh, what's a barrier in your skin? Well, this thing's like your skin. Remember, your skin is your cutaneous membrane. That's a barrier. That's going to be a line of protection. And it's going to be one of the first things a pathogen comes in contact with. If a pathogen wants to enter my body from the external environment, first thing it's going to see is the skin. You're going to have to get past that. Or there are places where you don't have skin. Oh, I mean, where is that? Think inside the mouth. Oh, if you open your mouth, well, that's not skin in there. Remember, that's a mucous membrane. So even your mucous membrane is a barrier protecting you from pathogens, keeping them from entering the body. These are examples of first-line defenses. Oh, but what if a, a pathogen, a bacteria, for example, were to get past a first-line defense? Well, don't worry. Well, there's a second-line defense. Now think it's gotten past the first line. It's gotten past the barriers. So now it's inside the body. What do you have inside the body to fight infections again? It's your white blood cells. So think your white blood cells and your antibodies, aka those proteins, they're going to be fighting infections. And when they fight, that's going to be part of what we call your innate immunity. We will see innate immunity in a second. Okay. 
And then, well, again, what if they get past these cells and these proteins? Well, you'll have another group of cells coming in to fight in what we call the third line of defense. It's going to be more white blood cells, different, a slightly different version. We'll see. We'll talk about this all in detail. This is just a summary slide. And they'll also provide protection in what we call your adaptive immunity. So as we go through the functions of your immunity, how do you fight the infection? We're going to have to talk about them based off these three lines. What's the first thing they're going to have to get past? What's the barriers? What's the first line defense? If they get past the first line, what else is there now inside the body? You're going to think cells and proteins. Or what if they get past that? Well, no worries. There's even a third line defense to back them up. We're going to go through this. We're going to go through immunity. How do you fight the infection? And yes, we're going to see as we go through it, it's going to involve different things, barriers, cells, and proteins, things inside of the body or outside of the body, on the surface of the body, helping to fight it. And I mentioned on the previous slide, there's something called innate immunity and adaptive. Now, we got to know the difference. I want you to know the difference between innate immunity and adaptive immunity. There are both immunity, there are both ways to help protect you from foreign particles, but how, what's going on? It is pretty simple in the difference. Innate immunity, think a non-specific immunity. Think it will have a non-specific attack. It's gonna take out anything that does not belong to you. It does not try to distinguish between who and who is who. Meaning it's not going to try to tell the difference. It's not going to try to read antigens to, t to identify a, a pathogen. It doesn't care. If you're not already inside the body or a part of the body, innate immunity will try to block or remove you. And then there's adaptive immunity. This one is now a specific immunity. This is the part of your immune system that will now tell who is who. It will read the antigens on cells to tell what cell is what and whether or not that cell is yours, a self antigen, or if that antigen is not yours, a non-self or a foreign antigen. So when we talked in, in our previous chapter about cells being able to read antigens to mount an attack, like your antibodies, like anti-A antibody attacks the A antigen, that was a specific attack you are seeing examples of adaptive immunity. When you talk about things like a transfusion reaction due to agglutination because antigens are attacking antibodies, that was a specific attack. Remember, a, a B, anti-B antibody will only attack a B antigen. An anti-RH antibody will only attack an RH antigen. These are specific attacks. These are adaptive immunity. So simply put, basically, innate immunity, non-specific, doesn't care who's who. And adaptive immunity is specific. It's based off the antigen. All right. So as we go through this, we're going to see different ways of both innate immunity and adaptive. And when it comes to adaptive, again, remember it's based off antigens. And so we could give another name or classify antigens one more time. Turns out antigens are also considered immunogenic, meaning they could trigger immune, an immune response, meaning they could trigger adaptive immunity. If your body sees an antigen that does not belong to you, your B cells will get activated and they will begin making antibodies to help attack. This is a type of antigen-specific attack. Antigens help to trigger adaptive immunity. Yeah. <clears throat> So let's go through some examples of these ways of defense. So let's say you're at home and you're eating an Oreo cookie and you drop it on the floor. And because you're home right now, no one's looking. You picked it up and you ate it anyway. Uh-oh. Turns out when you ate that Oreo, there was a germ, a bacterium on the, on the Oreo. And uh, how is your body going to try to fight it? Well, I told you. If that bacteria was on the Oreo, it's outside of your body. The first thing it had to get past was your skin. So your skin is one of your first line defenses of innate immunity, meaning your skin is innate. It does not care who's who. Your skin does not try to identify things based off antigens. Your skin does not know whether or not something should be inside or not. It just knows if it wasn't there already, it's not going to get past it. 
Okay, so your skin is a type of first line defense for your innate immunity. But your Oreo cookie got past the skin. Eh? How? Because you put it in your mouth. Uh oh. Okay. Oh, but you remember from our previous slides not too long ago, you saw you also have a lining on the inside of the mouth. Remember, that's your oral mucosa, aka your mucous membrane. It's basically like doing the same thing for, for the oral cavity. <clears throat> Turns out, it's also creating a non-specific barrier. The linings to your mouth doesn't care who's who. If it's not already inside your body, again, it will not let it in. Mm. So it's another first line defense, again, for your innate immunity. Other things as well associated with mucous membranes, even on the inside of your nasal cavity is mucous membrane. Think inside your nose as well. And in your nose, you also have hair. Your nasal hairs are helping to trap things. This is going to get gross, but it's true. I'm talking about boogers. All right. When you get mucus in the nose, partially it's there with hair to help filter out any debris, any pathogens, any antigens as you're inhaling and exhaling. And it will trap it with the hairs and the mucus. Then when the mucus dries, that's your boogers, and you remove them to remove those antigens. Someone needs to teach children anatomy because children love to eat their boogers. Turns out they're just putting things in your in their body that their body tried to prevent from getting in. Uh-oh, someone needs to teach babies about innate immunity. But anywho, these are all examples of this first line defense. They're the first things pathogens are going to come in contact with. These things do not care who's who, so they're a part of the innate immunity. Again, keep going. What if, for example, something were to get into your eye? Oh, what would happen if you were work, walking outside and something flew into your eye? What would happen? Well, you'll tear up. You'll begin to cry. Why? Because tears are also a part of innate immunity. A lot of the fluids in your body are a part of innate immunity. They could just flush things out. If something were to get in your eye, tears cannot identify who's who. Tears are like a wave of flu fluid helping to wash things away. So think of large categories of fluid in your body. Things like tears, even your spit, your saliva, your sweat, your urine. They could wash things away. So that's part of your innate immunity. All right, so it turns out simply washing things away actually works. So yes, do wash your hands. <clears throat> but again, other parts of innate immunity. Uh, what else is there? Again, think surface of the body. What other liquids are there? Let me give you a hint. Think your hair. Remember your hair is, a, is associated with the sebaceous gland that makes sebum. Ah, uh, think back to MP1. Remember sebum could also kill bacteria. Ah, uh, besides just conditioning and softening hair, yes, it's bactericidal. It could kill bacteria. And you remember, killing bacteria, well, that's protecting you from infections. That's an immune response. Because sebum, the oil coming from your sebaceous glands, is also one of the first things pathogens are going to come in contact with. So it's also a first-line defense. <coughs> Again, don't think on the skin. Also go back to the mouth. Oh, what's in the mouth besides your mucous membrane? Well, it's spit. I just told you, saliva could wash things away. But, again, from AMP1, if you went through the basic ingredients or parts of saliva, you might know there are enzymes in your saliva. I want you to know this major enzyme in your saliva associated with the lymphatic system. It's called lysozyme. Lysozyme. Lysozyme is an enzyme found in your saliva as well as other bodily secretions. That helps to kill bacteria. How? It breaks down the bacterial walls. And once you break down the bacterial walls, bacteria are susceptible to die. So lysozyme can kill bacteria. So it turns out, odds are, if you ate that Oreo cookie and it had a bacteria on it, hopefully the lysozyme in your spit helped to kill the bacteria. But let's say maybe you're having a little dry mouth. Uh-oh, not that much spit. You didn't have that much lysozyme. That little bacteria on the Oreo got past your spit and you swallowed it. Oh, now it's in your stomach. Oh, should you panic? Oh, hopefully not. Why? Think about stomach. 
Remember, in your stomach is really strong acids, hydrochloric acid. If I had enough hydrochloric acid, I could melt a table. All right. So hydrochloric acid is really strong. It could destroy a lot of things, including pathogens like bacteria. So again, hopefully if that bacteria didn't die from the lysozyme, hopefully that acid in the stomach will kill it. And if you're a female, you'll also have vaginal secretions. Even the secretions coming from the vagina can help to protect you. How? Turns out if you were to check the pH of vaginal secretions, uh, for, uh, you would notice that it's slightly acidic. And this acidic pH to your vaginal secretions helps to, to deter bacterial growth. Bacteria don't like to grow in extremely acidic environments. So having this acidic vaginal secretion will help to protect you from bacteria as well. And again, these are all things that pathogens will first come in contact with. So they're the first line defenses. That's, that's all you're seeing on these pictures here. The skin is a first line defense. Your oral, nasal, mucosa, your mucous membrane period is a defense. Think fluids, your tears coming from your lacrimal glands above the eye. That's your tear system is your lacrimal system. Think all the acid in your stomach, so digestive system helps, or the acid in the vaginal secretions. Or just think other liquids. Remember, your urine can flush things out of the urinary system as well. So these are all first-line defenses. And again, uh-oh, what if a bacteria or a pathogen gets past the first-line defense? Remember I told you, don't worry, you have second-line defenses. Think back to our summary slide. Remember, second line defenses are going to be things like cells and proteins. And like always, there are going to be lots and lots of proteins. I want you to know these major proteins and how are they helping. What are their functions? There are complement proteins. There are interferons. Iron binding proteins. And antimicrobial proteins. Know these proteins and their functions. And let's go one by one. Starting off first with your complement proteins. Your complement proteins are also helping to kill bacteria. How? They literally poke holes in the plasma membranes of these bacteria. They form what we call this attack membrane or this attack complex. But let's keep it simple. Complement proteins poke holes in the membranes of bacteria. So they're also helping you to, helping to fight infections, literally just killing bacteria. I almost think it's almost like they're stabbing and poking large holes in a bacteria. Keep going. Oh, what if it wasn't a bacteria on your Oreo? What if it was a virus? Oh, boy. Oh, hopefully you still shouldn't worry too much. Why? Because you have proteins called interferons. And before I mention the function of interferons, let me just briefly mention how viruses work in your body. Just a super light summary of how viruses work. When a virus enters your body, it will then infect cells. It will look for a cell, literally, to enter. And when it enters the cell, it's going to take some of its genetic material and implant it or integrate it with the host cell, the cell that it infected its uh, genetic material. And once it does that, that's going to change the cell into a factory to make more viruses. And once it's done, the viruses will burst out of that cell and go on to infect other cells, hijack their genetic material, turn them into factories to make more viruses until it dies and explodes to release them and they go and infect other cells. That's basically what happens when a virus comes into the body. And <clears throat> for it to do that, and it needs to do what we call viral replication. When it hijacks your genetic material, when it implants its genetic material with your whole cells, it's going to turn it into a fa factory to make more viruses. We call that viral replication. Turns out, interferons, they kind of give you a hint in the name. They're called interferons because they interfere with viral replication. That's their job. Interferons interfere with viral replication. Okay. So not only do you have protection from bacteria, you also have some protection from viruses. 
But keep going. We got to go back to bacteria. Turns out they're a big problem for your body. So your body has lots of ways to help protect you from bacteria. And that comes up to the next protein. It's called an iron binding protein. It has to do with iron. Turns out bacteria, some bacteria, could use iron as a food source. They use iron as food to grow, to help them to grow, for, for energy to help them to grow. And it's like your body knows that. So whenever you have a bacterial infection, it's like your body tries to hide all the iron so the bacteria can eat it. Okay. It makes the iron unavailable, meaning it's almost like it's trying to hide it. And the way you're going to hide it is by binding it to a protein, to an iron binding protein. That's what they do. Iron binding proteins bind iron to make it unavailable to bacteria so they can't grow. And then the last group of proteins on this slide are what we call antimicrobial proteins. They tell you the name. They're antimicrobial. They just straight up kill microbes. Mm -hmm. They could kill microbes and they could attract some of your white blood cells, your, some of your immune cells. Think T cells, B cells, and macrophages to that place to help out. Mm -hmm. So those are the proteins in your second line defense. If something's now in your body, you have proteins to help. Is the protein poking holes in the membranes of bacteria? Complement proteins. Is it interfering with viral replication? Interferons. Is it binding iron and making it unavailable for bacteria? Iron binding protein. Or is it simply just straight up killing bacteria, killing microbes, and calling other immune cells? Well, that's an antimicrobial protein. Keep going. There are other second lines of defense. Remember on our summary slide, yes, it was proteins, but it was also cells. It's your phagocytic cells. Think your macrophages. They do phagocytosis. Oh, again, main P1 again. Remember, phagocytosis is the process of cellular eating. It's how cells take in large particles, which can be other cells like bacteria. So when your phagocytes, Okay, when your macrophages eat things that don't belong, which can be bacteria, they're doing phagocytosis. They are a second line defense. And then two other examples of second line defense are inflammation and a fever. First is inflammation. We see inflammation is usually associated to, with irritating tissues. Well, in this case, inflammation is really your body's response to tissue damage. Whenever you say the word inflammation, you're saying my body is responding to a damaged tissue. That's what that is. Okay. And why might the tissue be damaged? Well, because maybe an infection or maybe you've been exposed to a toxin or maybe you just literally injured the tissue with an accident or trauma. But no matter what, your body's going to react to that tissue damage, and we call that reaction inflammation. And what might you feel when your body's responding to damaged tissue? Let me give you a hint. It could be the result of an injury. Think twisting your ankle. When you twist or roll your ankle, what do you see or feel? Well, it's going to swell because swelling, a.k.a. edema, is a sign of inflammation. It's a sign your body's responding to a damaged tissue. What else? If you were to put your hand on that swollen ankle, it might feel a little warm. Why? Because heat is a sign of inflammation. What else? What's the first thing you're going to feel when you twist your ankle? It's going to be painful because pain is a sign of inflammation. And you might even see some redness, erythema, which is also a sign of inflammation. These are all your body responding to damaged tissues, possibly because it's involved with an infection of some sort. So when your body's responding... That's a second line defense. We just call it inflammation. You will know because you would see redness, pain, heat, and possibly swelling. And then the last second line defense of your innate immune system is a fever. You notice whenever you get sick, you get a slight fever. Your body's temperature rises. Why? Well, it's trying to kill whatever is making you sick. And that's why your body's temperature is rising. But this is an innate immunity. Remember, that's non-specific. So when your body temperature resets, so to speak, when your hypothalamus thermal regulates, changes your temperature, it's not caring who needs a certain temperature. It's going to raise the entire temperature for your entire body. 
This could be a problem sometimes. Why? Because, yes, raising the temperature will hopefully kill things like bacteria, but at the same time, it's also possibly killing yourself. This is really a concerning kids. Little kids get really high fevers. And one of the things the doctor is going to focus on is actually, yes, the infection, but also trying to bring the fever down. And in extreme cases, they'll do things like dump a person in an ice bath. Why? Because that fever is innate immunity. Your body's getting hotter and hotter to try to kill the infection and not caring that it's actually killing you at the same time. Why? Because it's not identifying who's who. It's just a fever. Right. So these are all parts of your innate immunities, lines of defenses. And again, you're seeing some second line defenses on this picture here. You're seeing your complement proteins literally line up and poke a hole in the plasma membrane of a, of a bacterium. Or you'll see interferons interfering with viral replication, or in the bottom right, you're seeing iron binding proteins. Looks almost similar, yeah, but that is a hemoglobin molecule. That is a type of iron binding protein. Remember when we looked at hemoglobin, it is a protein made up of polypeptide chains. And in the center, we saw iron. So technically, yeah, hemoglobin is an iron binding protein. And you could use it to keep iron away from bacteria. And then there are the cells. I mentioned macrophages. They will eat cells that don't belong. And you remember, there were other cells that ate things that don't belong, besides macrophages. Remember, there was a cell that can eat and kill bacteria. Remember, that was your neutrophil. So yeah, it's a type of phagocyte. <clears throat> and then you have those other types of of secondary lines of defense. Inflammation, where you'll see pain, swelling, etc., and then on this picture, don't forget a fever. All right. Fevers help to kill things, but again, remember, be careful. It could also kill you. So don't let your fever run high for too long. So those are second lines of innate immunity. And then there's adaptive immunity. Adaptive. Think of this as the third line defense. Remember, this is just going to be more cells. In this case, when you think adaptive immunity, remember, this is going to be a specific attack. They're attacking things specifically based off the antigens. And not only is it a specific attack, it's a really fast attack, at least in certain cases. And not only can it attack things, it can remember. So we'll go through some adaptive immunity. And like always, things get, things get broken down. When we look at adaptive immunity, we break it up into two parts. There's two types of adaptive immunity. I want you to know the two types and the differences. What are the differences between the two types of adaptive immunity? There's something called cell-mediated adaptive immunity and something called antibody-mediated adaptive immunity. So on the next slides, we're going to go through these two types. I want you to know the major differences between cell-mediated adaptive immunity and antibody-mediated adaptive immunity. And like always, they give you a hint in the name, starting off with the first one. It's called cell-mediated adaptive immunity. It's called cell-mediated because you're basically talking about what cells do. And in this case, you're really talking about the T cell. And so you already actually know cell-mediated adaptive immunity because you already know about T cells. You know where to make them, in the red bone marrow, you know where to mature them in the thymus, and you know what they do. They kill in uh, cells. Which cells? Infected cells, cancerous cells, abnormal cells, and foreign cells, cells that don't belong to you. Turns out this is a problem in things like transplants. Remember, your body doesn't care that you might want something. All it knows that is, is that it's not yours because it's seeing foreign antigens, and so it's going to attack. This is a problem if you want a transplant, like a heart transplant. <clears throat> your body, your T cells don't know that your heart is bad, and so you need a new heart. That's why you're getting it implanted into your body. All your cells are going to see is a heart with lots of cells with antigens that are not yours, and they will attack. We call that a transplant rejection. Whenever you hear someone has rejected their transplant, what's really going on is cell-mediated adaptive immunity. Their T cells have attacked and destroyed 
that donated organ. So whenever you see or hear or know of someone who's had a transplant, one thing their doctor is going to prescribe are immunosuppressants. They're going to pre- prescribe medication to calm down or suppress their immune system, to calm down these T cells so they don't attack this foreign organ. Why? Because your cells are only going to do their job, so you got to keep them from doing it. Remember, if we know anatomy, we could take advantage of it. Remember, at the end of this class, you need a baby doctor degree because you know pretty much a lot of what doctors know. So that's really all cell-mediated adaptive immunity is. Think T-cell. You make them in the red bone marrow. You mature them in the thymus. They kill infected cells, cancerous cells, abnormal cells, and foreign cells. That is cell-mediated adaptive immunity. It is specific because T-cells will respond because of a specific antigen that it sees as being foreign or non-self, an antigen that's not yours. And again, there's another type of adaptive immunity. The other type is called antibody-mediated adaptive immunity. And again, it gives you a hint of the name. It's called antibody-mediated because now we're dealing with antibodies. And again, you know this already. Uh, remember, what cell makes antibodies? Remember, it's the B cells or the B lymphocytes. And you remember, where do you make B cells? In the red bone marrow. Remember, where do you mature B cells? In the red bone marrow. And remember, what are they making antibodies for? Because you see a foreign antigen. Maybe you see a foreign antigen on a virus, on a bacteria, on a fungus, on anything that doesn't belong to you. If your B cell sees an antigen that does not belong to you, it will specifically make an antibody for that antigen, and it will attack. That's it. When in antibody-mediated adaptive immunity, literally think B cells and what they do. So those are the two types of immunity. Are you talking about what T cells do? T cell me- or cell-mediated adaptive immunity. Or are you talking about what B cells do? making antibodies, then you're talking about antibody-mediated adaptive immunity. And these two types of immunity actually work together. Your cell-mediated immunity and your antibody-mediated immunity, they work together to fight the infection. So I want you to know, how does your adaptive immunity work? It works in about four major steps. So I basically want you to know the four major steps or the four major phases of adaptive immunity, all right? And know them in order and what happens in each step or each phase. And like usual, we're gonna go one by one in order. There are four phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. So let's go through them. Starting off with phase one, we're basically talking about fighting an infection. And you begin the fight, actually, before you're even sick. So phase one happens before you've even been exposed to a foreign antigen. So what happens before you even get sick? Kind of thing. What happens as you're, get, as you're a kid where you're growing and maturing? Same thing for your body and your cells. In phase one, you got to get the cells ready. You got to get your T and your B cells ready. How? You got to make them and mature them. So you know all of phase one already. Where do we make B and T cells? Red bone marrow. Where do we mature B cells? In the red bone marrow. And where do we mature T cells? In the thymus. That is all phase one. Phase one is you making and maturing T and B cells. That is it. And when you're done maturing them, they're not working. They're not active. They're inactive. Why? Because you're not sick. Remember, phase one is before you've been exposed. It's before you get sick. You're doing phase one as a little baby, as a kid, and going into adulthood. You're just making and maturing your T and B cells. That is phase one. Then, <clears throat> let's say you do get sick now. Now you pick that Oreo cookie up off the floor, and now you have bacteria or a virus or a fungus growing in your body. Now you're sick. Now you've been exposed to that foreign antigen. Now you're going to move on to phase two. And in phase two is you getting ready to fight. You got to pick the cells. Remember, this is adaptive immunity. It's a specific attack. Specific cells attack specific antigens. Remember, we saw just like with antibodies in our blood, in our transfusion examples in chapter 19, same thing for the cells. Each cell could attack a specific antigen. 
So when you come in contact with a foreign antigen, you got to pick the specific cell that could fight it, and you have to make clones of it. You got to make copies. You're going to do that in phase two. Okay. And the cell that you're going to have to activate is the T cell. So in phase two, you're going to activate T cells. And you got to know whose job is it to activate a T cell. Turns out, to activate a T cell is the job of what we call an antigen presenting cell. Right. They kind of tell you the name. An antigen presenting cell is a cell that will show or present the antigen. So kind of imagine... When you ate that Oreo cookie off the floor, there was a bacteria on it with foreign antigens. And when it got into your bloodstream, there was a antigen-presenting cell. Oh, I want you to know examples of antigen-presenting cells. I want you to know three major examples of an antigen-presenting cell. Those are macrophages, B cells, and dendritic cells. Oh, I remember dendritic cells are just another type of phagocytic cell. It's just another specific type of macrophage. But I'm specifically going to name these three. Macrophage, dendritic cell, and B cell. Those are your three major antigen-presenting cells. So again, imagine if that antigen, that bacterium, were to get into your bloodstream, one of these cells will come in contact with it and get an antigen and show it to the T cell. That's all they're doing. And when they show it to the T cell, that will activate the T cell. And once you activate the T cell, you're going to pick that one cell because it could fight that antigen, and you're going to make copies. You're going to make two large groups of, of clones of that cell. You're going to make what we call active cells, which are going to be the cells that are going to be involved with fighting. And you're going to make memory cells. I briefly mentioned earlier that adaptive immunity can remember. It's because of phase two. In phase two, you make memory cells. And the major job of these cells is not to fight. Their major job is to remember that antigen so that if your body comes in contact with that antigen again, you already have groups of cells ready and waiting to fight. Right. But again, keep it simple. For phase two, antigen-presenting cells activate T cells, and you're going to make clones. You're going to make active and memory cells. And that process of making these clones, these active and memory cells, is called clonal selection. And clonal selection is when you have your activated cell make clones, active and memory cells. And I think you selected the cell that could fight, and then you make clones. That's clonal selection. So that's phase two, antigen-presenting cells, activate T cells and it undergoes clonal selection to make copies that are active and memory cells. And if you notice, you still haven't fought that infection yet. In the phases one and two, you still haven't fought yet. Keep going. Then there's phase three. So by phase two, you've activated T cells. But you remember the other major group of cells in, in the lymphatic system are the B cells. Turns out they also need to be activated. And turns out it's going to be activated by a T cell. Turns out you have two major types of T cells. I want you to know these two major types of T cells. There's a cytotoxic T cell and there's something called a helper cell. Turns out in phase three, helper T cells activate B cells and cytotoxic T cells. That's the job of the helper cell. So technically in phase two, you activated helper T cells. And once they're activated, they will go on and activate B cells and cytotoxic T cells. All right. And then once you activate the B cells and the cytotoxic T cells, they will also undergo clonal selection. You would also make clones, so you have a group of active cells to fight and a group of memory cells to remember. And again, by the end of phase three, you still haven't done any fighting yet. Okay? You are just still activating your, your cells. You won't begin to fight until the last phase, until phase four. And this is really your T cells and B cells doing their job. Remember we said T cells will kill infected cells. 
it's really the cytotoxic T cells that are doing it. Cytotoxic T cells kill infected cells, abnormal cells, cancerous cells, and foreign cells. It's the cytotoxic T cell. Helper B cells simply activate B cells and cytotoxic T cells. And then you already know what B cells do. B cells will begin making antibodies. But when a B cell is actively making an antibody, its name changes. When a B cell makes an antibody, we call it a plasma cell. A plasma cell is just an activated B cell that is actively making antibodies. That's it. Are you not making antibodies? Just hanging around? Plain old B cell. Or have you been activated to make antibodies? Plasma cell. So those are the four major steps of adaptive immunity. You see it all on this one picture here. Let's go through those steps in order one more time. In phase one, you're going to make and mature T and B cells. You're going to make them in the bone marrow. B cells will stay in the red bone marrow to mature, and T cells will go in the thymus to mature. That is phase one. In phase two, Antigen presenting cells will activate a helper T cell. And then it will undergo clonal selection where you make copies that are considered active cells that will continue, continue on to fight and memory cells that will remember that antigen. In phase three, your helper T cells will activate B cells and cytotoxic T cells. And those B cells and cytotoxic T cells will undergo clonal selection as well, making a group of active cells to fight and a group of memory cells to remember. And then in phase four, the cells are going to do their job. Cytotoxic T cells will do cell-mediated adaptive immunity. They will kill those infected cells. And your B cells, once activated, become plasma cells, and they'll do antibody-mediated adaptive immunity. They will make antibodies against those foreign pathogens. And that's how you're fighting the infection with your adaptive immunity. And I told you, a lot of it had to deal with activating cells, like the T cell. I told you antigen-presenting cells needed to activate the T cell. If you're wondering, why couldn't the T cell just look at the antigen itself? Well, turns out T cells cannot recognize uh, antigens directly. It's almost like they can't read it. It's almost like the antigen is in a foreign language and the T cell can't read it. All right. So in order for a T cell to identify an antigen, your body actually has to attach the antigen to something else. Your body has to attach the antigen to what we call an MHC which is what we call, which is an abbreviation for a major histocompatibility complex, an MHC. It's just a protein. That's all it is. So in order for your T cells to recognize an antigen, it has to be attached to this protein called a major histocompatibility complex. And this is what your antigen-presenting cells are doing. That's why you needed your antigen-presenting cells. They will take the antigen and attach it to the MHC to form an MHC antigen complex. And that's now what your T cells could recognize. That's why you needed T cells to get activated by another cell. That other cell is helping to turn it into something the T cell could recognize. And you remember, I want you to know your three major types of antigen-presenting cells. There's the dendritic cells, your macrophages, and your B cells. They're the cells that are processing the antigen and attaching it to the MHC for your T cells to read. So that's all this slide is talking about. When a foreign antigen gets recognized by an antigen-presenting cell, the cell will actually eat it. It will phagocytize the antigen and break it into pieces. And it will take one of the pieces, one of the fragments, and attach it to an MHC to form an MHC antigen complex. And that's what it will present to the T cell. That's what it will show to the helper T cell to help stimulate and activate it. And that's the same thing the helper T cell is doing for the cytotoxic T cells. It's showing them the antigen to help excite these cells, and once you excite and activate these cells, they'll undergo clonal selection, make copies of active cells to fight and memory cells to remember. And that's all you're seeing in this picture here. 
this huge big blue glob is an antigen presenting cell. You can imagine it's something like a macrophage or a B cell or a dendritic cell. So when it sees that antigen, you see in step one, it's going to phagocytize the antigen. It's going to eat it. Now, once it eats the antigen, it's going to break it up. You see these little green structures. That's the MHC. It's going to take a fragment of the antigen, attach it to the MHC, and put it on its plasma membrane. And it's simply going to pass by a T cell and show it that antigen. And then you'll activate the T cell. That's it. That's why you need an antigen presenting cell. And then once you activate the T cell, in this case, the cytotoxic T cell, it'll do the work of doing cell-mediated adaptive immunity. It'll do the work of killing infected cells. So we got to talk about that. How does a T cell, how does a cytotoxic T cell kill an infected cell? Well, the T cell is not going to get its hands dirty, so to speak. It's not going to eat the pathogen. It's not even going to touch it. It's actually going to use enzymes. It's going to rain down enzymes to kill it. I want you to know these two major groups of enzymes that it's going to use to kill it. There's something called granzyme. That's one by itself. And there are two enzymes that are going to work together. They're called perforin and granulysin. I want you to know these enzymes. What does granzyme do? And what does perforin and granulysin do? How do they help to kill a cell? First is granzyme. Once again, that cytotoxic T cell gets activated and it finds the pathogen. One way, it could, or finds the infected cell, sorry. One way it will kill that infected cell is to release an enzyme called granzyme. How does this kill a cell? Granzyme is what we call a digestive protein. Basically, it's an enzyme that will break down lots of proteins in the cell. And will break down so many proteins that it will trigger the cell to die. Oh, you remember, programmed cell death is what we call apoptosis. So when a cytotoxic T cell wants to kill an infected cell, it can release granzyme to destroy proteins and trigger apoptosis. That's it. And the cell will die. And it gets a little, a little more complicated. Once the cell dies, it will get eaten by a phagocyte. A macrophage will come along and eat that cell. And that's how you will destroy that cell. That's how granzyme works. But again, this cell has another way to kill other cells. Remember, there's the enzymes, or proteins, perforin, and granulysin. How do these cells work? Turns out these proteins would kind of give a more dramatic response. Turns out they trigger cytolysis. They cause the cell to basically explode like a big bomb. And when the cell explodes, anything inside the cell will die as well. So this one is a, a very thorough killing. Not only will it kill the cell, it will kill whatever was inside the cell because it causes a cytolysis. Think a huge explosion. That will kill everything. And so that's what you're seeing on this picture here. One more time to summarize what happens. Or again, when you come in contact with an antigen, antigen-presenting cells will eat it, break it down, make it a process it, attach it to an MHC complex, and present it to a helper T cell. That helper T cell will then undergo clonal selection, making its two cl clusters of clones, the active cells that will continue on, and the memory cells that remember. Those active helper T cells will then go on to activate a cytotoxic T cell and a B cell. And that cytotoxic T cell, again, will undergo clonal selection, making clones a group that will fight the active cells and the group that will remember the memory cells. <clears throat> and it's the active cytotoxic T cells that are killing. And that's what you see the enzymes here. Remember granzyme, which you see off to the left column, the left side, that's showing granzyme. You're seeing the activated cytotoxic T cell release granzyme. And that granzyme is triggering apoptosis. It's triggering the programmed cell death. And when that cell dies, all it's really going to do is kind of release all the microbes that were inside. And so those microbes and that destroyed cell need to be eaten. They need to be phagocytized by a phagocyte, by a macrophage. And that's how you would get rid of things with granzyme. And over to the right side, you see perforin and granulysin. Again, when that activated cytotoxic T cell releases now granulysin and perforin, 
It simply causes the entire cell to explode. It will trigger cytolysis, and this is a big explosion. Not only does it kill the cell, it kills whatever was infecting that cell, whatever bacteria or major microbe was infecting that cell. So that's really how your cytotoxic T cells will kill cells. It's using enzymes. It's using proteins to do it. And then don't forget, you also have that antibody-mediated adaptive immunity. Don't forget about B cells. And you know this. We're just kind of summarizing it again. Remember, you first got to activate B cells. Remember, that's the job of the helper T cells. And again, once you activate your B cells, you're going to undergo clonal selection. You're going to make your two groups. You're going to make the active cells that will fight. We're talking about B cells. Remember, they fight by simply making antibodies. And you remember, when a B cell is making an antibody, we call it a plasma cell. <clears throat> so once a B cell undergoes clonal selections, it will make plasma cells, which are the active cells, which will go on to make antibodies. And then you will make memory cells. And I keep mentioning memory cells. <clears throat> memory cells, they give you a hint in the name. They remember. That's why they're called memory. They remember that antigen. So that next time you come in contact with that antigen, you'll have a faster response because you now have cells ready and waiting to go. You don't necessarily have to wait for clonal selection to, under, to, to occur. It will happen faster. That's why usually when people get sick with something and they get sick with it again, the second time or any subsequent time they get sick, they're usually not that sick. Why? Because you're just seeing the work of these memory cells. They remember so they can work faster. Remember, you don't begin to fight the infection with adaptive immunity till you hit f step four. So these memory cells kind of let you skip all the way to step four so that you can fight faster. That's why you want memory cells. And these cells live a long time. These memory cells could live almost as long as you do. So when you're a little 80-year-old male or female, you possibly could have 80-year-old little cells that remember the first time you sneezed as a little baby. That's what these memory cells are doing. <clears throat> and again, you're just seeing, again, the B cells side of the, of the work. You're seeing that adaptive mediated, or sorry, antibody-mediated adaptive immunity in this picture here. Again, helper T cells will activate a B cell. It will undergo clonal selection, making a pockets of memory cells that will live long to remember. And your plasma cells, which are the active cells, which are actively making antibodies. And those antibodies will attack the foreign antigens. And I told you, this is a specific attack. Remember, every antigen gets attacked by a specific antibody. So when you think about it, there are lots of antigens. Every single cell, every single substance on this planet has antigens for your body to recognize. And your body will have to be able to make antibodies for each specific antigen. So it turns out your body makes tons of antibodies. And you know by now, whenever your body makes a lot of something, we're going to classify it. So when we look at antibodies, remember another name for an antibody is an immunoglobulin. So when we look at antibodies, we're going to have to classify them. <coughs> Excuse me. And when we see antibodies, we break it up into five major groups. That's what you see on this chart here in table 12.1 on this slide. This shows you the five major groups or classes of antibodies. I want you to know the five major groups, the five major classes, and what is their function. It's all on this slide, but you can keep it as simple as I'm about to mention. So what are those immunoglobulins? What are those antibodies? There's IgG. And when you see these names, the IG, I lowercase g, is short for immunoglobulin. So when you say IgG, you're really saying immunoglobulin G or antibody G. There's IgA or immunoglobulin A or antibody A. There's IgM, IgD as in dog, and IgE. Those are your five classes of antibodies. So what are they doing? Let's go one by one. Starting off with IgG. Turns out immunoglobulin G is an antibody that protects you from bacteria and viruses throughout the body. It's a basic type of antibody. Turns out most of your antibodies, about 80% of your antibodies, are this one basic antibody. So it's doing that ma major job as fi of fighting antigens. But keep it this simple. 
It protects you from bacteria and viruses throughout the body. That's it. Keep going. There's also IgA. IgA is very similar to IgG that in that it helps to protect you from bacteria and viruses. But it doesn't do it throughout the body. It does it in specific places like your mucous membranes and your bodily fluids. And bodily fluids are things like your sweat, tears, saliva, your mucus, and even things like breast milk. These, will all, these are all bodily secretions. So these are all places where you can find IgA helping to protect you against bacteria and viruses. And this is important to know. Remember, if we know anatomy, we could take advantage of it. You might have known this if you've ever been around or you yourself or a pregnant female. And if you were a pregnant female or know someone who's been pregnant in the hospital before they leave, one thing the doctor might recommend is that they breastfeed their baby. And you might have heard of lots of advantages for breastfeeding. And you might have heard that one advantage is that you help to give your kid a stronger immunity. Well, now you know how. Turns out when a mom breastfeeds her baby, in her breast milk, she's giving her baby some of her IgA, some of her antibody A's. And that will help to protect the baby from bacteria and viruses. So if you can, yeah, breastfeed your baby. At least one reason is that you're giving them some antibodies to help fight infections. But again, keep it this simple. IgA helps to fight bacteria and viruses on mucous membranes and bodily secretions or bodily fluids. Again, there are other antibodies. Keep going. <clears throat> Next one is IgM. IgM is in man. I IgM or antibody M is actually an antibody we've talked about before in our previous chapter on blood. Oh, how? Remember in our blood chapter, I told you there were specific antibodies for each antigen on the surface of your red blood cells. Remember, there was anti-A antibody, anti-B antibody, and anti-RH, <clears throat> or anti-D antibody. And remember, these antibodies caused agglutination. They caused red blood cells to clump together and then undergo lysis, rip apart. Those antibodies that triggered agglutination and lysis of your red blood cells were IgM antibodies. That's the job. IgM antibodies cause agglutination and lysis and things like when you get a transfusion in mismatched blood, blood that was not complementary. That's IgM. Then there's IgD. I keep mentioning a lot of these antibodies are fighting foreign antigens, but not all of them. Like this next one, IgD. Turns out IgD is involved with activating B cells. Turns out IgD doesn't even call or doesn't even fight infections. It just activates B cells. And it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Kind of think when you're fighting an, uh, an infection for an antigen, you're using up your antibodies and you're gonna have to replace them. You're gonna need new ones. You're gonna have to call for reinforcements. You kind of think of IgD calling for reinforcements by helping to activate B cells so that they can make more antibodies. <clears throat> But again, keep it simple, IgD activates B cells. That's it. And then the last group of antibodies are what we call IgE. <clears throat> Whenever you see the E in IgE, kind of think eosinophils. Yeah. Kind of think that. It's not really involved with eosinophils, but kind of think that. Why? It has to deal with the function. They kind of function very similar to eosinophils. Think back to our last chapter. Remember, one major function of eosinophils was to fight parasites, like parasitic worms. Well, that turns out that's actually the job of IgE as well. They help to protect you against parasitic worms. Oh, and remember, eosinophils also had another function. Besides fighting parasites, parasitic worms, eosinophils also caused allergic reactions. Turns out IgE is also involved with causing allergic reactions. That's why I said whenever you see the E in IgE, think eosinophils, so they actually kind of act the same. But again, keep it simple. IgE causes allergic reactions and protects you against parasitic worms. So that's your major antibody groups or classes. That's your major immunoglobulin groups. 
Again, keep it simple. IgG is protecting you from bacteria and viruses throughout the body. IgA is also protecting you from bacteria and viruses in your mucous membranes and bodily secretions or bodily fluids. IgM is causing agglutination and lysis of red blood cells in mismatched blood transfusions. IgD is activating B cells. And IgE is causing allergic reactions and fighting parasitic worms. So you basically know how your immune system works now. <clears throat> and these next couple slides are just us putting it all together now. Now that you know how everything works, let's go through that example one more time of what would occur if you were to get sick. Again, you're at home. You're eating your Oreos. You drop one on the floor. You eat it. You pick it up. Uh-oh, there was a pathogen on it. There was a bacteria. And this is the first time you're seeing this pathogen. You haven't seen it before, so there are no memory cells. This is your first time. Remember, you're going to activate your helper T cells, and helper T cells are going to go on to activate cytotoxic T, cytotoxic T cells and B cells. And again, you're going to do your clonal selection, making active cells to fight and helper, and, sorry, memory cells that will remember. And then you'll launch your attack. Turns out to do all those things takes some time. And all of these activities of fighting this infection for the first time is what we call a primary immune response. And this takes time. It could take several days to weeks for you to mount a primary immune response, to do, to do all those steps of your immune system, your innate first and second line defenses, and then to have your adaptive cell-mediated and antibody-mediated immune responses all occur. That takes time. Like right now, people are concerned about the coronavirus. That's why they're giving you about a two-week span to stay home and isolate yourself if you're sick because you're going through your primary immune response that can take weeks. It takes time for your body to do all those steps. But at the end of it, if, if you recover at the end of it, you'll have memory cells there so that if you get exposed to it any other times, any subsequent exposures, meaning, meaning if you get it again, Hopefully it won't be as bad of an experience because you now have memory cells that remember they're fighting faster and you won't feel as sick as you did the first time. And when you talk about getting sick any second time, third time, fourth time, any subsequent exposure, any ex other exposures after the first time, I told you your body's going to now have memory cells that are going to attack. Anytime your body's responding to uh, a foreign antigen, on any subsequent exposures, meaning after the first time, you're going to undergo what we call a secondary immune response, meaning your memory cells are finally going to be able to do the work. And this is going to be faster because I told you they're already there. So your secondary immune response could happen within hours or possibly days. So some people get exposed to antigens quite often, regularly, but they might not even notice they're sick because their body has already fought the infection within a matter of hours. Why? Because they had memory cells that remembered and mounted the attack faster. That's why you're making memory cells any times you get sick, so that any time you get exposed to that antigen or that pathogen again, you'll be able to fight it faster. And like usual, if we know anatomy, we could take advantage of it. Turns out I could tell if it's your first or subsequent times getting exposed to a pathogen. How? I just simply take a sample of your blood and count how many antibodies I see. We call that an antibody titer. That's how many antibodies. They're literally counting. Yeah. Turns out if it's your first time getting exposed, like what you see on this picture, I'm not going to see that many antibodies. Because your body, again, has to go through all those steps, and then you're finally going to make some antibodies in phase four of your adaptive immunity. So I'm not going to see that many antibodies if it's the first time you've been exposed. But let's say you get exposed to it again a second time. Well, if I were to take your blood sample now and look at the antibodies, I'm going to see a higher antibody number. Okay, especially IgG. Remember, that's the major uh, group of antibodies. I'm going to see a ton of them if it's any subsequent exposure. Because now, again, your body's still going to go through the steps in order as if it's the first time. So you're going to have a bump uh, up in antibodies. But those memory cells are also going to be making antibodies. So you're going to have the initial 
response antibodies plus these memory cell antibodies. And you're going to get a lot more. So just by seeing how many antibodies you produce in response to an infection, I could theoretically tell if it's the first or any other time you've been exposed. That's all that, that image was showing you. And then to finish off this chapter, we kind of talk about, like usual, when some things go wrong and usually how you get help to fix some of these things. So let's talk about something that could go wrong. One thing that could go wrong with your lymphatic system is called an allergy. I'm talking about allergic reactions. Another name for an allergy or an allergic reaction is what we call a hypersensitivity reaction. So if you've ever been told you've had a hypersensitivity reaction, they were just being fancy. They could have just said you had an allergic reaction. So what happens here? What happens in hypersensitivity reactions or allergic reactions? This is an immune system problem. It's a dysfunction. Turns out it's a probably problem of your memory cells. They misidentify an antigen. That's what's going on here. When they say it's an immunological memory dysfunction, they're basically meaning your memory cells have misidentified an antigen. Remember, your memory cells are supposed to remember the antigen that got you sick. Sometimes they mess up and they'll see an antigen and incorrectly identify it as the antigen they thought they were supposed to remember. And that's going to trigger your immune response to something that wasn't necessarily supposed to make you sick. And you'll call that an allergy or an allergic reaction. You're still uh, reacting to antigens, okay, but it's just a misidentification, so to speak. And this will be to things that aren't necessarily pathogenic, but they will trigger a response. So think things that you're allergic to. Yeah. Things like food, like shellfish. Some people have a shellfish allergy. Well, shellfish don't technically try to attack us, but they do have antigens on their cells and your body can misidentify those antigens and cause an allergic reaction. And that's anything. Think of anything that causes allergies. Pet dander is just some pet cells, hair and spit or secretions. That's pet dander. I think things coming from pets. Food could do it. Pollen from plants, even medications. Your body's just reacting unfortunately, by misidentifying, but they're reacting to the antigens on those things. And you will interpret that as an allergic reaction. Not only are your cells misidentifying antigens, remember antibodies attack. Remember there's an antibody associated with allergic reactions. Remember that's IgE. IgE antibodies will then bind to cells called your mast cells and basal fills and activate them. And when your mast cells and basal fields get activated, they release a chemical called histamine. Histamine would lead to a couple things occurring. Turns out histamine can cause vasodilation. It can cause blood vessels to get larger in size, in diameter. And they get so large that sometimes they get leaky. And you'll see that leaking as swelling. Remember, swelling is just you seeing fluid around the cells. It's just you having a lot of interstitial fluid. In this case, it's because some of it leaked out of the blood vessels, thanks to histamine vasodilating. What else could it do? Turns out it, it can cause contractions in the smooth muscles of the airway, meaning it could cause your airway to kind of constrict, kind of squeeze. That's why when some people have allergic reactions, especially severe ones, they tend to have a hard time breathing. You're just seeing constriction of the airways, again, thanks to things like histamine. And you'll even see things like increased mucus secretion. Think a runny nose. So let's say you have a basic pollen allergy. You go to smell a rose. Maybe you're allergic to the rose. You're going to have things like maybe your nose will get a little stuffy. You're seeing some uh, swelling thanks to some vasodilation. You might have some runny nose. Again, that's your increased mucus secretion. It might get a little stuffy, hard to breathe. You're just seeing contra uh, contractions or constrictions in the airway, thanks to things like histamine. But again, if we know this stuff is what happens, we could take advantage of it. Let's say you want to smell that rose, even though you're allergic to it. Uh, what's something you could take when you have an allergic reaction? It's called Benadryl. You could take Benadryl when you have allergies. 
Ah. And if you were to read the box on Benadryl, what does it describe Benadryl as? It's an antihistamine. Now you know why you take Benadryl when you're having allergies. Now you know why you take antihistamines. They're helping to block the action of histamine so you don't have that runny nose from increased mucus secretion so that it's easier to breathe, etc. Remember, if we know anatomy, we could take advantage. So now you know what all these symptoms of allergies are. Now you know why you're having a runny nose, increased mucus secretion, you're sneezing, you're having nasal congestion and it's hard to breathe. You're just seeing all these uh, symptoms because of the actions of histamine. And you want to treat allergies, especially severe ones, especially if you're allergic to things like shellfish and you eat it and your face blows up and it gets hard to breathe or even th with things like peanuts. If you have a severe allergy, you want to treat it. Why? Because if you don't, there's going to be a worse consequence coming besides having difficulty breathing. You might fall into what we call anaphylactic shock. Shock is when your heart cannot pump enough blood around the body. Kind of think of almost like a type of heart failure. Why? This case, it's due to a constriction of the airways. If you're not getting air in, you're not bringing in enough oxygen, you're not supplying the heart with enough oxygen, it's not going to work, it might stop beating. That's anaphylactic shock. But no worries, you might know what you could take to prevent this. Huh? Think about people with things like bee allergies or peanut allergies. What do they always keep around? It's called an EpiPen. Oh, it's called Epi for epinephrine. If you ever have an allergic reaction, you could take epinephrine to try to help prevent or get you out of this anaphylactic shock. Think of all those things that histamine caused. Remember, histamine could cause your airways to constrict, to get smaller in diameter. Well, you want to be able to breathe to bring air in so your heart could maintain oxygen levels in, in your blood and pump it around. So you're going to have to open up the airways. Remember, epinephrine could dilate your airways, make it open so you could breathe. And it'll even help to increase the contractility, the force of the contraction of the heart and the heart rate. Again, remember shock is when your heart's not pumping the blood in adequate amounts. So you're gonna use this EpiPen to open up the airways and basically strengthen the heart so that you don't fall into this anaphylactic shock or at least help to get you out of it. That's why you wanna keep an EpiPen around if you have severe allergies. You're helping either to prevent this anaphylactic shock or possibly rescue it, rescue it from it. So that's a little bit on allergies. Okay. And then real quick, we're just going to mention something else about your adaptive immunity. Turns out, like always, we could classify things. We could break things down. And when we look at adaptive immunity, we break it up into two legs or two groups. There's active adaptive immunity and there are the passive. I want you to know the difference. I actually want you to know the four major types of adaptive immunity. They're all located in this little chart or this table off to the side, table 12.2. There's four major types. There's naturally acquired active immunity, naturally acquired passive immunity, artificially acquired active immunity, and artificially acquired passive immunity. I want you to know the difference between all four of these types of immunity. And you see some of them have the word active in the name and some have the word passive. This is all adaptive immunity. And we're mainly talking right here about antibodies. Where are you getting the antibodies from? That's basically what these four types of immunities are. So when you go through them, I basically want you to know where are the antibodies coming from and how is your body fighting the infection, okay? Not all of them have to deal with antibodies directly, but a lot of them do. So let's go through. First up is active, and there's passive. We're talking about antibodies. Whenever you hear the word active, think your body is actively making antibodies. When do you actively make antibodies? Well, think when you're sick, like when you have a cold. So that's active. So some of these will be active. Think your body's actively making antibodies. But in some cases, there are passive immunity. In passive immunity, think you're getting pre-formed antibodies or pre-made antibodies. Your body is not actively making it, it's getting it from somewhere else. That is passive. You're already getting pre-made antibodies. 
So let's go through these four types of adaptive immunity. I want you to know the four types and just simply what's going on. Keep it as simple as we're about to mention it. Starting first with naturally acquired active immunity. Again, it's an active immunity, so you're actively making antibodies, and it's called naturally acquired because you're naturally doing it. So when do you naturally make antibodies? Well, when you're sick, when you've been exposed to a foreign antigen. That's what this is. In naturally acquired active immunity, the body will make antibodies and fight the antigen that it's been exposed to. Think when you're sick. This is the natural sick process. Then there's naturally acquired passive immunity. Again, remember passive means you're getting preformed antibodies and naturally means you're doing it in a natural way. Ah, in anatomy or biology, what's a natural way for someone to get pre-made antibodies? Let me give you a hint. Think back to your antibody classes. Think back to bodily secretions. Remember I told you a mom could give her baby antibodies. How? When she breastfeeds. Breastfeeding is an example of naturally acquired passive immunity. That baby is naturally getting pre-made antibodies in its mother's uh, breast milk. So in naturally acquired passive immunity, you naturally get pre-made antibodies. Think breastfeeding. And then you have the artificial types. Whenever you see the word artificial, think in a lab. Think man-made. So think in a hospital. What can my doctor do? Okay. So first is artificially acquired active immunity. Again, active immunity, so you are making the antibodies. And artificially, how do I artificially get you to make antibodies? Well, basically, you're trying to trick the body into thinking it's sick. Oh, how do you do that? That's actually the job of vaccines. When you get a vaccine, that vaccine will contain either a part of the, of the pathogen, not the whole thing, or maybe a weakened part pathogen or maybe a dead one but no matter what you're injecting this pathogen or fragment of it to expose your body to that foreign antigen and your body will think you're sick your body doesn't know you just injected a antigen itself not a whole pathogen or or even a dead one your body will still go through the process of innate and adaptive immunity your primary immune response, and you will make antibodies. You just did it artificially. Your body just thought it was sick when it really wasn't. Think vaccines. And then artificially acquired passive immunity. Again, passive, you're getting pre-made antibodies. And you're doing it artificially. Okay. What's an artificial way to get antibodies? Think an injection. Your doctor just straight up injects antibodies into you. That is a type of artificially acquired passive immunity. Oh, when do you have to have pre-made antibodies injected into you? That's actually what we what is uh, what we call anti-venom, snake anti-venom. If you ever get bitten by a snake, a poisonous snake, you need to rush to the hospital for some anti-venom. Turns out when they inject you with anti-venom, all they were injecting you with usually, was just antibodies, all right? They were injecting you with antibodies that were already made, and they're injecting it. That's an artificial process. That's a man-made process. That's a lab type of process, so it's an artificial. Mm -hmm. So those are your four major types of adaptive immunity. Know them, again, uh, all in what's going on. One more time. Are you making antibodies because you are exposed to an antigen, aka you're sick? Naturally acquired active immunity. Are you getting pre-made antibodies like a baby breastfeeding? That's naturally acquired passive immunity. Are you reacting to our antigen thanks to things like a vaccination so that your body then goes on to make antibodies? That's artificially acquired active immunity. Or are you just getting antibodies injected into you like with snake venom? That is artificially acquired passive immunity. Let me show you know your different types of immunity. And I mentioned one of them, this artificially acquired active immunity, you got to use a vaccine. Okay. And I told you a vaccine could either be the entire organism, just weakened. If you have a vaccine that's made up of a weakened pathogen, we call that an attenuated vaccine. Or you could get a vaccine that contains the pathogen, but it's dead, so it won't hurt you. 
or you could just get a piece of the organism. All right. So vaccines, if it's just a dead pathogen or part of it, should not make you sick. Or if it's a uh, weakened or an attenuated. Not everyone could get an attenuated vaccine. Because you can see in an attenuated, the pathogen is alive. It's just weakened. And you don't want to give an attenuated vaccine to someone who has a compromised immune system. To someone with a weakened immune system. Because if their immune system is weak, even if the pathogen's weak, it could possibly make them sick. So you usually only give attenuated vaccines to healthy individuals. Mm. Everyone else, if you're concerned, maybe you might have a weakened immune system. You do not want the attenuated version, usually. And so when you give the vaccine, your body is going to do its job. It's going to see the antigen. Then you'll go to the steps of activating your cells. Same process. Your antigen-presenting cells will activate helper T cells. Helper T cells will then activate B cells and cytotoxic T cells. And your B cells will go to work making antibodies. And that's how vaccines work. The point of a vaccine is not to keep you from getting sick. Right. By the end of a vaccine, all you're going to have are antibodies and memory cells. The whole point of a vaccine is to help trigger a secondary immune response if you happen to get that pathogen. So kind of think of the flu vaccine. Every year, your doctor asks you to get a flu vaccine. And when you get that flu vaccine, you're just getting, again, some antigens of what we suspect will be the virus that's going to be uh, the most virulent for the season. And all that's going to happen is your body's going to activate B cells. They're going to make some memory cells and some antibodies. And that's it. That's all the vaccine does. So that when you live your life and you go out into your community, if you do happen to get sick with that virus that they predicted, well, then now your body is going to act more in a secondary immune response because you already have memory cells and antibodies. So you will attack it faster and hopefully not get as sick. The whole point of a vaccine is to trigger a secondary immune response, not to keep you from getting sick. So if you ever hear a friend say, oh man, I'm not getting the flu vaccine because I got it last year and I still got sick. No, that's not the point. Your response is, should say, hey guy or gal, I don't know. Hey, stupid, please take the vaccine. The whole point is, did you die? If you didn't, well, the vaccine worked. Okay, why? Because it probably helped you to trigger your secondary immune response. You fought that infection faster and didn't die for it. Because remember, people could die from things like the flu. So yes, you do want to take your vaccines. And yes, you could probably still get sick. The whole point is that you now launch a secondary immune response, a faster, stronger response, and hopefully you don't die. Okay. So that's now how you, you know how vaccines work. Please take your vaccines. <clears throat> and then we go back to when things go wrong. Another thing that could go wrong with your immune system is called autoimmunity, an autoimmune response. When you hear the word autoimmunity, think your white blood cells are attacking you. Oh, why might my white blood cells attack me? Because they're supposed to attack foreign antigens. Huh. Turns out this is a problem of self-recognition. They lack self-recognition. Basically, your cells have lost the ability to tell who's who. So kind of think of it as them attacking anybody because they can't tell who's who anymore. It's a lack of self-recognition. Recognition. They can't tell who's yours. They assume everybody is foreign. They attack. And we've seen examples of this in anatomy. It's things like diabetes, especially type 1 diabetes called juvenile diabetes. Remember, juvenile diabetes is an immunological attack on the pancreas, where you destroy the uh, uh, the beta cells, the islet cells. And this is because they cannot tell that those cells were yours. So your white blood cells attacked the pancreas, destroyed uh, the islet of Langerhans, and now you have diabetes type 2. Or another example was Graves' disease. Remember, Graves' disease was an, Im uh, an immune attack on the thyroid gland. They were attacking because, again, they couldn't tell who was yours, and they just attacked. And so whenever you hear autoimmune problems or autoimmunity, think your cells are attacking you. Why? Because they can't tell who's yours anymore. Mm -hmm. And is, is there any chances that you might have an immune, autoimmune problem? Uh, is there any... 
people are at a higher risk for autoimmune diseases? Turns out, yeah. Turns out about three quarters of individuals with autoimmune diseases are actually women. Okay, most of people with autoimmune diseases are usually women between the ages of 15 to 45. But turns out women, even though they're more likely to get it, they're usually more likely to get less severe autoimmune diseases. While men, on the other hand, even though they're not as likely to get an autoimmune disease, if they do get it, it tends to be more severe. So it's like, uh, do you be a female where you're likely to get one, but possibly not as severe or male where you're not as likely to get one, but if you do, it's more severe. So those are kind of the relative risks for autoimmune diseases. And then to finish this chapter, we look at this one last thing that uh, could go wrong with the immune system. It's an immune system attack, basically. It's an infection still, but it's a very serious one, still a concern today. We're talking about HIV. Why is this such a problem still today? It's been here for decades now. What's the problem? Well, there are a couple major problems with this infection why, and, and kind of entailing why it's so hard to eradicate. For one, there are no identifiable symptoms. Or meaning there are no unique symptoms to HIV. There are symptoms. I know this slide says there are none. There are symptoms. It's just that the symptoms are not unique to HIV. So that's one pro- problem. If there are no unique symptoms, you can't readily, easily tell that you have it. And if you don't, can't tell that you have it, what's likely to occur? Well, it's likely that you're going to spread it to other individuals. And that's another problem. Turns out it's relatively easy to spread this virus. Why? Because it spreads via bodily secretion exchange. When do people exchange bodily fluids? Well, you might exchange bodily fluids if you have unprotected sex. That would lead to the exchange of bodily fluids from male to female or female to male. Or same-sex exchanges as well. Or you might exchange fluids if you do things like share needles if you're an IV drug user. When you use a a needle, even though you might not see it, there is still blood at least on the tip of the needle. And so if you're sharing needles, you are exchanging bodily fluids and you might expose yourself to this virus. So these are some reasons why it's so hard to eradicate. For one, people don't even t- can't even tell that they have it. And if they can't tell, they won't get tested. And it's easy to, to, uh, for it to spread via bodily fluid. That's why we have to still talk about this virus today. But again, it's still a virus. And like all viruses, it doesn't really survive that well outside the body. Outside the vi- body, like any other virus, HIV doesn't last that long. Okay. And like any other virus, outside of the body, you can easily get rid of it. It's a germ. Okay. So think, how do you get rid of germs outside of the body? If you wanted to sanitize something, what do you do? Well, you heat it up. You cook it. All right. Only problem is, if a person's infected with HIV, you can't cook that person. Remember, fevers could kill you too. But outside the body, just heat it up. You'll kill it. What else? It's just a germ. Like any other germ, you could get rid of it uh, with cleaning products. Okay. Think Lysol. Okay. Think germicidal cleaners. Think things like hydrogen peroxide or alcohol. All right. Um, let's say you're working in a lab. Maybe you spilt or contaminated something with HIV. You could disinfect it with cleaners. Again, the problem is inside the body. I can't give you hydrogen peroxide. If you were to drink hydrogen peroxide, it will kill you too. So inside the body is the problem. Outside, it's super easy. Even if it's on your clothes, wash the clothes, you will wash it away. It's inside the body where it's wreaking the most havoc. Outside the body, it's like any other virus. And so we got to talk about how this virus works. I mentioned earlier in the chapter briefly how a virus works. One more time. Remember, when a virus enters your body, all right, it will take its genetic material, or sorry, when it enters your body, it would find the cell and infect the cell. It will enter the cell and incorporate its genetic material with that cell's genetic material. And when it does that, it will turn that cell into a factory to make more viruses. It will make copies. It will do viral replication. But 
Turns out viruses don't have DNA as their genetic material. Turns out viruses have RNA as their genetic material. And before they can incorporate it with our DNA, they need to turn our their RNA into DNA. Huh. We know how to turn DNA into RNA. Remember, the process of turning DNA into RNA was called transcription. Well, it's like vi- viruses have to do transcription in reverse. So we say they do reverse transcription. They turn their RNA into DNA and then incorporate that with our DNA to turn our cells into a factory to make more copies. And when a virus has to turn its RNA into DNA, when it has to do transcription in reverse, we call them retroviruses. So HIV is a type of retrovirus. It's a type of virus that has RNA as its genetic material, and it will do reverse transcription to turn it into DNA before incorporating it with our whole cell DNA, with the DNA of the cell that it infected. And once it does that, the cell will go on to make copies of the virus. And then once it makes enough copies, the cell will burst and die, releasing the copies that will go on to infect more and more cells in your body. And they will do the same. And this is a problem for HIV in particular because of the cell that it chooses to infect. It's like it chose the one cell that can help to take it out. Turns out it infects helper T cells. And it will kill the helper T cells when those cells release the viruses when it dies. This is a problem. How how is it a problem? It's like it took the one cell we needed to help fight it. Remember, helper T cells activate B and cytotoxic T cells. Well, if you get, get all the helper T cells and you kill them, well, there's nothing to help activate your cytotoxic T cells. They won't be able to go ahead and kill infected cells and the infection will continue. It's almost like they took the one cell that could help to fight it. That's why HIV is also a problem. This is another reason why it's so hard to eradicate. We can't naturally get rid of it because it infects a very important cell in our process of fighting infections. It infects the helper T cells. So if you know someone who has an HIV infection, one thing the doctor will monitor is the viral load, is how much virus they have. But they will also monitor their T cell counts. Because if I see your T cell numbers decreasing, I know the infection is still raging because your HIV virus is infecting and killing your helper T cells. So this is one reason why doctors monitor T cell counts. It's giving me a window as to what's going on. And again, I mentioned HIV does have symptoms. It's just not unique symptoms for HIV. You'll just feel like you have any kind of other virus, even like the flu. You'll have a fever, possibly. Maybe you'll have chills, uh, muscle aches, fatigue, night sweats. It's, It's bland symptoms you can have for pretty much any infection. That's why people can't necessarily tell they have HIV. And it's, it's possible you'll have these infections. There are individuals that absolutely have experienced no symptoms, but again, The key thing here is no unique identifiable symptoms. And then it gets worse. It does something weird. After a while, after a person has been infected, yes, they'll possibly go through these initial flu-like symptoms, but then they'll experience what we call a latency period where the symptoms go away, where they have absolutely no symptoms. This is what we call the latency period. And the reason why they're having no symptoms is because their T cell numbers aren't plummeting all the way to zero. It's stabilizing at a very low number still, but enough to help fight any other infections, just not the HIV. And so they won't necessarily feel any symptoms. And even though they're not feeling any symptoms, they still have the virus and they could still spread it. So lots of problems for this virus. You might not know you have it because this is no identifiable symptoms, easy to spread, and you might experience a latency period where you think there's nothing wrong and you still have the virus and you'll still continue to spread it. (laughs) They will resume having symptoms, but not for a while. They will resume having symptoms once their T cell levels drop to a significantly low level. 
When it drops to a significantly low level, that's going to open the door for other infections. Remember, you need your helper T cells to activate BN T cells. So you won't be able to fight other infections and you might get sick. Once you get sick with a different infection on top of your HIV, you're now typically classified as having AIDS. All right. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, is just HIV plus what we call an opportunistic infection, plus an infection that has took, taken the opportunity to infect you because your T cell counts are too low. So that's what usually kills people from HIV. It's not necessarily the HIV itself. They die from something else that has taken the opportunity to infect them usually. Right. And even with AIDS, there aren't usually any identifiable symptoms. Again, it's just you're going to feel sick. You're going to feel tired. You'll have sweats, possibly. You'll possibly lose weight because if you're sick, you might not eat that much. And it takes a lot of energy to fight infections. So you might lose weight. You'll have night sweats, possibly diarrhea. And you'll possibly even see symptoms of whatever opportunistic infection you also got infected with. So that's AIDS. It's just you not, or the person not treating their HIV, and so their T cell numbers drop, and they get infected with something else, and then they die. That's what happens. Why? Because your body can't fight it. Why? Because it took that one cell you needed to activate the other cells. So if you don't treat your HIV, how long do you have? Well, it could vary. Yeah. Untreated patients, it depends on the person, this is just based off your textbook, on average, an untreated person with HIV will progress to AIDS within a matter of years. Okay. On average, there have been individuals that progress extremely rapidly within a matter of months, but there are some individuals where it seems that they progress within a matter of years. And once you progress to AIDS, then the life expectant expectancy decreases significantly. Once you've been diagnosed with AIDS and you continue not to seek treatment, then at most usually you'll have a year. But again, these are just averages. It depends on the person and the situation. So big things are to get tested because you won't tell by yourself because you there are no unique identifiable symptoms. And then once you're tested, if you're positive, you need to take your medication. Why? Because that medication is going to help to keep your T cell numbers high so that you could fight infections, other infections. Remember, you die from those opportunistic infections usually. So we got to talk about therapy. Remember, it's very important to take the medication. There are ways to treat HIV. It's not going to cure it. Okay. Currently, there are no cures. We only have preventative medicines and medicines to treat. But these treatment medicines are not eradicating the virus. They're not getting rid of the virus. Okay. So we got to look at some of these medicines. I want you to know these two major medicines involved with fighting or treating an HIV infection. They're what we call reverse transcriptase inhibitors and protease inhibitors. I want you to know the difference between a reverse transcriptase inhibitor and a protease inhibitor. How are they helping to fight this HIV infection? Well, first is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Hit inhibitor. Remember, they tell you in the name. Yeah. Remember, HIV is a retrovirus. In order for it to incorporate its genetic material with your host cell, with your cell that it's infected, it needs to do transcription in reverse. It needs to turn RNA into DNA. And for it to do transcription in reverse, it uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Rever HIV reverse transcriptase is just an enzyme HIV will use to turn RNA into DNA. Well, if we know that's what happens, we could block it. Reverse transcriptase inhibitors, they tell you in the name. They inhibit reverse transcriptase. And if you inhibit that, uh, the virus cannot turn its RNA into DNA. And if it cannot turn its RNA into DNA, it cannot incorporate its DNA with yours, and it will not turn your cell into a factory to make more cells, and your cell will not die. This is how you're going to help to protect your T cells. You're going to use a reverse transcriptase inhibitors. 
in some prep meds, you might see in commercials for HIV, pre, HIV prep medications. Some of them might contain reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Why? Because if the virus can't turn its DNA into RNA, well, it won't be able to incorporate it into your cells and hopefully you won't rage with the infection. So that's one thing. Reverse transcriptase inhibitors inhibit reverse transcriptase so that virus, the virus cannot turn its RNA into DNA and incorporate it with yours. But again, you need to attack it in multiple ways because this virus mutates. We need multiple angles of attack. There's another way to attack this virus. Another way is with what we call a protease inhibitor. Now, it's an inhibitor. It tells you the name. It's inhibiting a protease. Oh, what's a protease? This is another, vi another enzyme the virus will use. Turns out, once it incorporates its DNA into yours and it begins to make the virus, it makes the virus in pieces and the pieces need to be assembled. Okay. Kind of thing, almost like a Lego piece set. You need to assemble an HIV virus. Right. And in or order to assemble it, you need this protease enzyme. Okay. HIV protease enzymes cut out the proteins into pieces to assemble the entire virus. Well, if you don't want to assemble it, well, you block that protease. And that's what the job of protease inhibitors do. They block the action or inhibit the HIV protease enzyme so that you won't be able to assemble the virus. And if you can't build it or assemble it, well, it can't go on to infect other cells and you will protect the T cells. So you can see from the actions of both these medicines, none of them have gotten rid of the virus. They've only interfered with what the virus does, either with that reverse transcription or with assembly. You have not gotten rid of the virus. You have only interfered with its actions. So when you hear about HIV therapies, medicines, they are not curing the virus or curing the individual of the virus. They're only interfering with what the virus can do. Okay. That's why it's important once you're diagnosed with HIV, yes, for now at least, you have to take your medicines forever. All right. So that's HIV and the therapies. And these are just two ways to attack this virus. There are multiple ways to do it. When people get HIV therapy medication, they usually get a cocktail, more than one medicine. We call this cocktail highly active antiretroviral therapy or heart therapy. It's just a collection of these medicines. And in this collection, you should at least have those two medicines I mentioned before. You should at least have your reverse transcriptase inhibitor and a prote protease inhibitor in this cocktail. Why? Because this cocktail is going to help to pr protect your T cells from dying. And if they don't die, you won't see that drop in T cell number. You won't get an opportunistic infection. You won't progress to AIDS and hopefully you won't die because of this. You'll hopefully live your long enough lifespan and die from a different natural cause. So now you know about HIV. And these slides are just showing you uh, some pictures related to the virus again. This first image is just showing you places where you might experience symptoms once you progress to AIDS. And again, the symptoms are usually due to, in AIDS, usually due to that opportunistic infection. So if you get an opportunistic infection in the brain, maybe you might see some uh, symptoms similar to encephalitis. Encephalitis is just when you have an infection in the brain. Or maybe you have an infection in your lungs. Oh uh, yeah, you could get pneumonia as your opportunistic infection or anywhere else. All right. So that's all this slide is showing you. And then this slide is just showing you what's expected if you do not get treatment. What you're seeing on this chart is a little uh, a line chart. The green line is showing you their T cell numbers over a period of time. And the red line is showing you the viral load, meaning how much of the virus is in the body over a period of time in an, inf in an infected individual. And so it starts off at uh, around week zero when you get um, your initial infection. When you get your initial infection, you're going to have a lot of the virus coming in from wherever uh, your source of the infection was. But initially, your T cell count is going to be really high. Okay. 
And your body is going to do its usual thing, try to mount a, mount a response. But again, the virus at the same time is going to do its thing and infect helper T cells. So over time, you're going to have a drop in T cell count, a significant drop over the first couple of weeks of the infection. As the virus takes uh, control of those cells, turns them into factories to do viral replication. So over the first couple of weeks, you're going to see high numbers of the virus as it's doing its job. And you're going to see low numbers of the T cell count uh, as it's taking those cells and killing them. Then after a while, like I mentioned before, you'll hit your latency period where your T cell numbers stay relatively stable, but the virus is still there. It's just almost like it's slowed down now, but it's still infecting cells. So over the next couple years, possibly, again, remember, this depends on the person. So over the next couple weeks, months to possibly years, that virus will continue to slowly work, taking over your helper T cells and killing them eventually. So over time, you'll continue to see that drop in T cell number count as your HIV numbers increase until the point where it gets low. And what's considered low in medicine is when your T cell counts get into the hundreds. Okay. Usually around the four, 300 count is very, very, very low. And that opens the door for those opportunistic infections. Why? Because you don't have enough T cells to mount an attack to help protect you from other diseases. And once you have those other diseases, you're that opportunistic disease. Again, you're classified as AIDS. And remember, after that, you do not have that much long to live. So that's all this line graph was showing you. So your best protection, if you're ever diagnosed with HIV for a long life, is to take your medicine. You got to take that heart therapy, that cocktail. On this image, it must be from like 1980 because you see her cocktail or his cocktail, the person in this picture, has a ton of drugs. Nowadays, they've taken almost all these same drugs and compacted them into about one or two tablets. So even if you're diagnosed with HIV today, you're still taking many meds. It's just that nowadays you could cram a lot of them into possibly one or two tablets but you're still taking a cocktail of medication. And now you know about your immune system and when some things go wrong. And that's the end of this chapter.